Today's business will include a briefing from the Northern Ireland ports around Brexit and current issues, then we have consideration of the draft report on a legislative consent motion, and that is in regards to business and planning bill, and consideration of subordinate legislation. We have apologies from Dolores Kelly. And then just moving on to Chairman's business, um, I have I received a letter which will be in PACS next week, but it's just in relation to um, the test exemption for vehicles over um, 40 years old. I received correspondence obviously from the Association of Old Vehicle Clubs in, in Northern Ireland, and they are in receipt of a letter from Alex Boyle, which um, has come as an instruction really from the Minister in that um, officials have been asked to begin the process of progressing the necessary legislation through the Assembly in order to bring that exemption forward. If members are content that we contact the Minister just in relation to that to try to push that along because this is something obviously which is, has been outstanding and obviously then bring it in line with the rest of the United Kingdom if members are content to do that. Yeah, okay. And there's also easing pressure on MOT test well, centres as well. well absolutely. Yeah. And th th that point has been made on, on a number of, of occasions. Um, and I know that she was talking about bringing forward a suite of um, legislation, but I think this is, an, this is an easy win with regards to that. And it would be, I think, just if the committee could show its support sort of collectively um, and try to get that pushed on. Okay. Thanks, thank you, members, for that. Moving then to draft minutes at page six for your pack, and that's for the meeting of the 24th of um, June. Are members content? Great. Okay, thank you. Matters arising at page um, 12, you'll see the, the, the items listed um, from that meeting. Are there any issues that members wish to discuss or content? Page 15, we have the outstanding requests for information as well. So um, there's, a, there's a few now outside of their time as we've moved now into July. So we'll maybe revisit that again next week. And if we need to, then send, a, send gentle reminders out to those concerned. Yep. Okay. Content. Page 22, um, there's the committee, committee motion on the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, committee staff facilitated consideration by members of the wording of the motion for debate, and there was a divergence of views. There were two alternative motions were worded and forwarded to members for their views on their preference, and there's options one or two, which you're obviously aware of. Um, members responded, three opted for option two and six for option one. Those opting for option two were Roy Beggs, Dolores Kelly and Andrew Muir, and the remaining for option two, option one, sorry. So therefore, option one was agreed as the committee motion going forward, and I understand that will be tabled for Monday's business. Okay. Moving then to our briefing from the Northern Ireland ports and this on Brexit and, and current issues. We have page 24, the briefing papers from the ports, and Hansard will also be recording the meeting. And if members can be mindful of our time and that we do have four um, organisations responding. Good morning. So. Good morning. Good morning. And can I welcome Roger Onson, General Manager and Director of the Port of Lorne, Mr Morris Bullock, the Finance and Compliance Director at Belfast Harbour Commissions, David Hume, Holmes from uh, the Chief Executive Officer of Warren Point Port, and Brian McGrath, Chief Executive of London Derry Port and Harbour Commissioners on Foyle Port, um, as they're also known. So, gentlemen, you're all very welcome to um, today's meeting. Um, normal times we would have already have met um, and had visited probably um, each of your each of your um, facilities at this <coughs> stage and had probably a very lengthy and detailed conversation um, but as we, as <coughs> circumstances that we're currently in unfortunately we have our meeting set up in, in this way in order to allow for social distancing um, if you're content I'll ask each of you in alphabetical order um, to <coughs> um, speak for around five minutes and then members will um, ask questions and then each of you can answer um, as you feel that you need to if you need to contribute to um, the response. So if I can ask um, Morris um, to start off um, yes, and um, then we'll follow up with um, with Foyle, Lorne and Warren Point. 
Okay, thank you. Okay. So, um, thank you, Chair and committee members, and thank you for the invitation to today's committee. So, um, we have a relatively short briefing uh, for the committee today, and I've put it down on one piece of paper. So, I'll just go through the briefing paper and just perhaps add some explanations and illustrations to uh, explain our rationale. So, just to start uh, and set the scene, obviously, you'll be aware Belfast Harbour Commissioners is a trust port. It is the largest uh, port in Northern Ireland and, ha- and the second largest on the island of Ireland. It handles about 70% of Northern Ireland's seaborne trade in terms <coughs> of cargo tonnage. Uh, those figures tend, you know, they move up and down slightly each year, but that roughly is the steady state. Um, probably the significant thing for us on the Northern Ireland Protocol is that about 70% of this traffic is directly to and from the island of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, so it obviously dominates our traffic. Uh, 70%, however, is the overall figure, and that includes cargo both ways, both from Northern Ireland and into Northern Ireland. And when you break that down into the export and import leg, it's a slightly different pattern. So we have 85% of the export side goes directly to the island of Great Britain. And it's actually, I think, I've got down there 60% on the import side. The reason why the import side is a good bit lower is obviously that we, uh, as well as bringing cargoes from Great Britain, we also bring them from the European Union, but actually we do more cargo with the rest of the world. Um, so a lot of the import cargoes are bulk cargoes that come from elsewhere in the world. Obviously, the 85% out represents the, the, the markets of Great Britain. There is uh, obviously some traffic goes through Great Britain to the European Union, and some traffic comes through back through Northern Ireland to the Republic of Ireland, but uh, we don't, we've never been able to get definite metrics on that. I mean, we've got some anecdotal figures from carriers, but it tends to be low percentages, very low percentages. So I think the conclusion that we would have is that the predominant amount of that traffic is basically staying in Northern Ireland at the overall level, albeit you know the border doesn't really exist in terms of uh, trade flows because historically some cargoes come in here and go south of the border, some cargoes come through Dublin, uh, but there's not really a, a properly validatable you know, data source to actually put hard numbers on that. Um, so that gives you a summary of the overall position. Probably the single greatest concern for us is freight ferry traffic. Uh, obviously, all ports operate in different cargo modes. So we have three principal cargo modes in the Port of Belfast. There's bulk traffic, which is things like oil, animal feeds, coal. We have container traffic, almost all of which is routed through Europe, albeit most of it belongs elsewhere in the world. And finally, freight ferry or roll-on, roll-off traffic. So the, re- the freight ferry traffic is about 50% overall, and that is 100% of our traffic flow. And I imagine when my colleagues speak, they'll mention that as well. So the 550,000 freight movements each way with Great Britain obviously is our primary concern from the port operation perspective. So obviously, if we had one sort of aspiration coming out of the process, it would be to preserve the, fle- the free-flowing nature of traffic between Northern Ireland and Great Britain insofar as that is possible, given the constraints that will apply from the 1st of January uh, 2021. Um, you know, at 500, I've mentioned in my paper that the figure for all of the ports and freight ferries is 850,000 freight units. Now, that's, that's a lot, and I've just to illustrate that, the Port of Dover, for example, does 2.6 million freight units, so the, the amount of ferry traffic <coughs> moving from Great Britain to Northern Ireland is very substantial, I would suggest. Um, I want to then go on into more specifics on uh, what we're doing around the level of preparedness in terms of getting ready for the 1st of January. So, currently, um, the position is that the Port of Belfast is engaging directly and quite extensively with both DERA and that's the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, and also with uh, HMRC. Now, the position on that is that we are uh, basically working with DERA on a point of entry facility in the Port of Belfast, and I think it is important to note that that will represent an expansion of the the previously existing uh, point of entry process. Um, there, There is already Uh, an inspection facility in the Port of Belfast for dealing with uh, what are are technically referred to in various things like cytosanitary and phytosanitary, which is SPS, products of animal origin, sort of food type industry. It's probably easier to refer to those as agri-food type things. So it already is the case the Port of Belfast has a facility to to do that, but that facility needs to be expanded to cater for the effect of the Northern Ireland Protocol. And we're I would suggest very well advanced with DERA in terms of 
an in, an in principle agreement as to how that uh, point of entry facility will be structured and how it will operate. Um, the second um, agency we're dealing with is HMRC. Now, um, HMRC we're also engaged with as well because we know at the moment there will certainly be processes to take account coming into Northern Ireland from Great Britain. Just um, now, probably the biggest uncertainty for us um, at the moment is obviously the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, exists, and then the United Kingdom government issued the command paper on Northern Ireland on the 26th of May, I think it was, or thereabouts. And subsequent to that date, the government agencies have been able to basically ramp up their engagement with us in, in terms of getting a level of preparedness. But obviously, we would note uh, that the uh, command paper is not actually agreed in the current form with the European mm -hmm. Union, so that obviously represents something of an uncertainty in the current uh, circumstances. So that's, that, is a, that is a notable point, I think, for the committee, because obviously, <coughs> uh, from a port operations perspective, we would like to get as much certainty as possible. But having said that, we're still well advanced on the working with HMRC. Now, the other uh, thing that probably is, I think, significant, just to finish off my comments, is, you know, we, uh, Brexit has been going on for a while. We've all attended lots of stakeholder events by various government bodies. It tends to be the case that, obviously, the port is a very important function in Brexit, but actually the focus of the impact will not be the port. It will be elsewhere. In fact, it's going to be on the government side. It's going to be the requirement for HMRC and DERA to run their processes. And on the sort of the, the commercial side, the, the, the emphasis and onus will actually be more on ferry operators, uh, hauliers, uh, the owners of cargo, i.e. traders, and finally there are various intermediaries. So the port basically inside its business model has a role to play in terms of facilitating the DERA um, point of, a new and expanded point of entry, but it actually doesn't engage directly in any cargo operations or cargo handling, and it doesn't actually engage directly in the pre-existing customs processes that exist. There's obviously, you know, about, I think, just about 18 percent of our traffic through the port is already non-EU and consequently has that. So there is, a, there is a, a body of expertise in the port and the ship agents, but that's the intermediary. So I think the, the, the point I would finish on is, you know, it, um, a lot of these conversations with government bodies over the years have started talking about the port, and then as officials and others have then delved into the matter in more depth, I think the focus of attention then pivots fairly quickly to where the real uh, impacts will be, which is on ferries, traders, and uh, hauliers. Uh, I think that concludes my remarks. Uh, thank you, Chair and committee members. Okay, thank you. Brian? Yes, uh, good morning, Chair and, uh, and members of the committee. <clears throat> Thank you for your invitation today. Um, just to say on behalf of uh, Foyle Port and the London Derry Harbour Commissioners, um, I, I provided a briefing paper, I think, uh, which committee members should have, and uh, I, I don't intend to sort of go through that line by line. Um, maybe just to point out a couple of the issues which members may be uh, interested in. In relation to Foyle Port, um, we... Uh, operate in a rather unique um, situation within the entirety of the United Kingdom um, in that we are the only uh, harbour commissioners or port that, that is trans-jurisdictional in the sense that we span uh, both the United Kingdom uh, territory and operate within the Republic of Ireland as well. So um, we are a gateway to Europe and the United Kingdom simultaneously, uh, which is a, a fantastic uh, position to be in. Um, it's rather our most pressing issue is not so much the east-west trade between uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland, but rather ensuring that the, the gateway uh, for the northwest regional economy is maintained yeah. and protected, and that the competitiveness of what we do for the regional economy is not eroded by any new uh, red tape or bureaucracy that's brought in. So the Commissioner's corporate position was always very much in support of uh, maintaining those uh, free flows of trade. And uh, we, on a daily basis, um, uh, leave Greencastle and Donegal uh, with our pilots to go out to collect the ships to bring them into uh, uh, Lissahalley, into um, the UK side of things. So um, for us, Brexit uh, is quite an existential threat. Um, if, if there were to be a hard border created, it could be uh, absolutely critical to our, our, our future well-being. 
Um, so we have been looking, in, by way of preparation, uh, working with the Department for Infrastructure in terms of physical preparation to have the capacity to deal with any of the uh, issues which may arise, whether it is through backlogs of lorries or the like. Um, we are a bulk port um, where we are primarily uh, supporting the agri sector in the, the whole of the northwest region um, and also the, uh, bringing in imports of oil and coal as well as animal products and fertilizers. So, um, as our colleagues in Belfast and the other ports have been, we have been working closely with DERA as well uh, in the aftermath of the command paper. Um, to try and ensure that whatever designations are required to maintain those free flows of uh, commodities uh, are in place, and that uh, on day one uh, of the new dispensation in January, if that is when it is going to be, that we are not finding that um, uh, we get blockages coming through the port that ultimately would affect um, whether or not customers would choose to continue to operate through Lissa Halley. Um, so the port... Um, uh, we have an extensive jurisdiction which runs over 75 square miles of the entirety of Loch Foyle, from Craigavon Bridge in Derry to uh, a point between McGilligan and Greencastle at the extreme edge of the loch. And, uh, that is where the uniqueness of our jurisdiction comes. Our legislation predates partition, uh, and we are recognised by both governments as being the single authority to operate on that body of water. And that, that's a very uh, important avenue for us going forward uh, to maintain our existing trade and develop new trade as well. So, um, as far as we're concerned, uh, we have the physical capacity. We have uh, a 150 acre land bank, uh, which is adjacent to um, up, up to 1,000 acres of industrially zoned land. So, within the entirety of the United Kingdom, we've probably got the capacity, uh, some of the best capacity for growth. Uh, of any port in the UK. Um, and we have, through the Department for Infrastructure, vesting rights that allow us to uh, seek to protect the harbour undertaking uh, to protect that sustainability. So we don't have any problem from a capacity point of view. Um, and because we are not dealing in rural traffic, um, we, the work that we've done with DERA would indicate that we have a lower risk of impediment in terms of future trade. But we need to make sure that, um, that, that, that that's the case, and we'll work closely with them going forward. Okay, thank you. Roger? Uh, good morning, Chair. Good morning, Committee members. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Board of Directors of Lyme Harbour Limited, I'd like to thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to come and talk to you about our business. Um, <clears throat> unlike uh, the other ports in Northern Ireland, we're a privately owned business, ultimately owned by a, a business out in Dubai. Um, we have some very simple business objectives uh, to operate safely, etc., etc. And uh, we, uh, as Larne Harbour Limited, we operate the service to Cairn Ryan from Larne. And I have dual hat in the business. I'm, as well as being general manager for Larne Harbour Limited, I'm also the general manager for the P&O Larne Cairn Ryan service. I've been in the ferry business for 20 years, and I've been in the marine business for 43 years. So I've been around a wee bit. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the key issues, and I would really support what Morris has already said in terms of the RORO business. We are, since the publication of the uh, NI uh, protocol, we've been working extensively. We'd already been having numerous discussions with various uh, 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 d governmental departments, but of course, up until the time of the publishment of the, the, the protocol, it was a bit unclear as to what was going to happen. Now we've got that, we've been working very closely with them. The plans are very close to fruition. Uh, I've got no real doubt, based upon the uh, understanding and the discussions that we've had so far, that we will reach uh, an accord with them. Um, I think that uh, we're all very clearly aligned on three issues to comply with the Northern Ireland Protocol, to ensure as best we can that unfettered trade continues between UK and uh, Northern Ireland, and to maintain the speedy discharge process uh, for um, P&O ferries. Uh, and just an interesting number to keep in mind is 300, 305 metres from the bow of our ferry to the port gate, which immediately accesses straight onto the dual carriageway A8. So typically, the discharge of a ferry can take anything between 20, 10 and 20 minutes, depending on what traffic is on board that ship. And if you get an intervention of, in that 
operation of say five to ten seconds you're talking about quite a significant impact in terms of time frames because if you think about it 305 meters is not very long a ship can typically take around about 1,500 meters or one and a half kilometers so we've all been in traffic jams and if you put an impediment in that to take it out of the port then very quickly the traffic backs up onto the ship and uh, you know one of the things that uh, so that's that's a key issue for us because Roro is about speed and uh, in terms of the traffic that we move, uh, to put it into context, at the, uh, if you like, the nadir of the market around Easter time, we will be typically bringing in, in and out with P&O around about 2,000 freight units a week. At that, that's what we did that week. Typically, it's about 4,000. So my reading on that in very simple terms is that that 2,000 was the products that are really needed on the shelf in the supermarkets, in the stores, et cetera, et cetera. So that kind of gives you a, a feel for the type of goods that are going to be of interest uh, under whatever, however the protocol operates from the 1st of January. And I think, and, and I think Morris uh, mentioned the word groupage. That's when you get a lot of different consignments in one particular trailer. So, uh, and the haulier may not know exactly what's in those, uh, certainly doesn't at the moment. And, uh, I was asked a question when all this kicked off post the, uh, post the uh, vote, and somebody phoned me up and said, please tell us what's on your ships when it's coming in. I said, I don't know. He said, well, you must know you're running a ship. I said, well, have you spoke to your man who runs the uh, toll road from Birmingham down to London? Does he know what's on his toll road? No. I mean, we know what hazardous cargo is on the ship. We know what chilled, contain or chilled trailers are on the ship. <coughs> we know what livestock is on the ship. We have a very rudimentary understanding of what's in the trailers, but that's fairly crude in its analysis. So, for example, our people collect data at port of entry as to what's in a trailer. So it could be chicken, but is it a rubber chicken? Is it a live chicken? Is it a, what is it? You know, it can be all sorts of things. So it's, uh, it's difficult to know precisely, but I think it's fair to say that everything that you, pretty much everything that you see on the shelf, that you buy off the shelf, everything that you buy through Amazon or whoever it happens to be, comes through a ferry. So it's that sort of stuff that we use day to day. Um, in terms of current issues, I suppose the big issue for us is, is economic uncertainty. Uh, you know, we are facing, in our opinion, a significant recession post uh, when, you know, companies are weaned off uh, furlough and all that sort of stuff uh, and then when you add in uncertainty as to what's really going to happen post transition then that does give our business cause of concern and uh, I would just finish off by a couple, making a couple of points we are very close to agreeing where we need to get to and what we need to do to get a spade in the ground to be ready for the uh, 1st of January that's on hold at the moment because I believe there's a discussion going on between uh, DERA uh, and we have an excellent relationship with Dennis McMahon and his team and they've been very understanding of what we have to do and it's certainly not been you're going to do this, it's been how can we work together to deliver three objectives. Uh, and what I would say is please give that, please put whatever pressure you can on, on whoever it is to give them the green light to go and do what they need to do so that we can get that in place. The second thing that I would ask, and Morris touched on it earlier, is HMRC. Our biggest concern in all of this is that effectively what you've got to have is a system that tells HMRC what is coming into the country. So let's take a groupage trailer which may have 50 consignments in it for various different uh, receivers in Northern Ireland. Uh, that all has to be what they call wrapped up into a, uh, uh, a computerized message that they do something with, and then they tell. Then when, we, that, when that trailer gets to the port, the check-in people have to put in the reference, <coughs> send it to the HMRC system, and the HMRC then come back and say, yes, that trailer is okay to ship. Now, I guess some of you have been to Cairn Ryan. Uh, Ken Ryan does not have much run runoff space either for P&O ferries or for Stenline. Uh, and when I first joined P&O in 2014, November, Stenline's berth was out of action for about five days. So all the traffic came through one location. There was complete gridlock and mayhem in Ken Ryan. 
because there's no, you know, there is, there's talk about, for example, the former port of Stranra, you can get about 100 trailers in there, 100 trucks. So the point I'm making is if that process gums up in Scotland, because the HMRC system doesn't work effectively with the traders, the hauliers, the ports and the carrier, then there is going to be a problem. And what I know about IT systems, I don't know a great deal, but I do know that they tend to take a lot longer to put in and cost a lot more than everybody thinks. So anything that you can do to put pressure on HMRC, I know that's not easy, uh, to give real clarity as to what it is they want and how it's going to work, will be hugely helpful to the whole supply chain. And then just one final thing that I'd like to say is that, uh, I, as you know, I've been in the marine industry for uh, 43 years. I went to sea as a cadet in 1977 and I was a, a navigating officer on board ships and I've worked in the port industry since that time. And uh, what I would like to do is to commend to this assembly those men and women who work in the port industry and who work in the maritime transport industry, uh, who are generally the unsung heroes because without what they do, the stuff that we take for granted on our shelves would not be there. And the thing that struck me is I've been driving to, I live in Bangor, I, drive, I, I work in Larne, I've been driving to and from work because I'm an essential worker every day since, well, since whenever, throughout this crisis. And I remember one day I was filling my car up with, with fuel and the fellow behind the counter said to me, oh, were you still working? I said, yeah. Oh, who do you work for? I said, I had my p and jacket on at the time. I said, p and oh, are the ferries still running? I said, yeah. I said, you see all this stuff around you. If the ferries weren't running, then it wouldn't be here. And the point of that is that we all take how that works completely and utterly for granted. And I would appreciate if you could, you know, perhaps make that point. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And then finally, David. Yeah, good morning, Chair, members of the committee. Um, more in point, we, in 2019, we handled three and a half million tonnes of cargo. We're a multimodal port, which means that we have a, a roll-on, roll-off ferry. We handle containers, we handle break bulk, bulk and uh, project cargoes. Uh, during 2019, University of Ulster estimate that we therefore put some 9.6 million back into the immediate local economy of, of Warren Point and Urie. Um, our liaison with uh, the Department of Infrastructure through 2019, I'd characterise as open, productive and supportive. Um, there was a competitive uh, bid process in the final quarter of uh, 2019 to help ports ready themselves for Brexit. Um, we prepared that application in October, uh, back in October. There was certainly more uncertainty than there is now. Um, but we were successful in that and managed to um, reconfigure the, the port's road layout and warehouse uh, portfolio to gain six acres back, which is very significant in, in a harbour that has a total of 60 acres. So we retook 10% of operational footprint. Since the end of May, when the command document came out, um, which is what, just over a month ago, um, we have uh, also tied in with a, with a, with a highly performing Adara team who, more or less in the, in the space of three weeks, presented us with three sets of drawings based on a gap analysis um, that would help us, given that we also have been uh, uh, an incoming inspection point for 27 years, but would help us comply with the broader EU regulations that will kick in from the 1st of January uh, 2021, so far as we know. Um, an emphatic point that we made during those discussions was that, given Warren Point's uh, you know, very picturesque setting, that um, any development uh, should be very, very sympathetic to, to, the, to the environmental aspect. So we actually went as far as, uh, as Dara taking on board our requirements, for example, that uh, you know, if there has to be an inspection centre, you know, could it have a grass roof? So that, that was the, the, the kind of initial detail that we had already been talking about. Um, but as with, with the, the rest of the ports here, um, for whatever reason, those discussions have, have ground to a halt. Um, so we're not entirely <coughs> clear on, on what the next steps are. We were all given to believe that there was a, a 22nd of June deadline for DERA to pass their applications to DEFRA and that DEFRA were, were then required to apply to the EU 
for uh, extension or modification to uh, inspection point uh, facility licenses by the 29th. But that, that's come and gone, and that, and that hasn't happened, and we're, we're not too clear on that. Um, as, as, uh, as Morris from, from Belfast Port has explained, you know, ultimately it is the, the, the ferries, the traders, and the hauliers who have to get to grips with most of these changes. We, we are you know, primarily a facilitator. Um, but obviously, as a facilitator, we like to be you know, absolutely in the loop and, and able to support those, those key customers. And finally, I'd, I'd just reiterate uh, Roger's comments about the, the performance of the ports during COVID. You know, Warren Point, we're so proud of the fact that we haven't had a single case. Uh, we've worked very hard to, to ensure that that has happened. We haven't had any absenteeism issues. You know, the guys have you know, showed up and kept you know, the island's supply chain moving. And uh, you know, we'd, we'd particularly thank all of our employees for their, for their tremendous flexibility during these recent challenging times. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you've all referred to your expansion projects and, and obviously the uncertainty in relation to um, where we have been with regards to um, Brexit and, and moving forward. Just in the, in the absence of uh, any agreement between the United Kingdom and the EU, particularly on the level of physical um, ins inspections, and that's particularly around SPS, how have you been able to um, ascertain what's required moving forward and, and certainly what contingency plans do you have in place in, in the absence of not being able to have facilities required in, in, at, the, at the necessary date? <coughs> and I'll ask Morris first. Yeah. Well, <coughs> so um, yeah, the only way I can answer that is refer to the process with DERA. So obviously we've had very good engagement with DERA. And we think we've reached agreement in principle on the sp specification, layout, and design of the new inspection facility. So we're really relying on DERA to produce that in good time. Now, I have to say that process, a bit like my colleagues here, we've had very good engagement with DERA. They've been very, very focused. So we rely on that process. Now, the issue is the principle uncertainty I referred to in my opening <coughs> remarks. It seems to me that DERA are getting ready for probably um, I wouldn't, wouldn't like to say worst case scenario, but maybe more, you know, an outline scenario where there is a problem. So I think hopefully they will be in a position to, you know, to give the government uh, some sort of reassurance on that. But we are very much because they are the intermediary, if you like, between us and uh, the European Union. On top of uh, that, in terms of contingency, we have of course reserved additional land assets in the harbour. So just in case there is more congestion and the free flow is interrupted <coughs> more than we thought. We do have uh, land assets reserved aside to allow more trucks to be um, uh, stored temporarily if need be. So, but I think the, the, the core of the question, from our, the core of the answer from our perspective is that it depends on DERA. And just with regards to anyone else, Brian? I, I, I sus would suggest, uh, Chair, that uh, our dilemma about Brexit and whether or not um, arrangements can be made to uh, maintain the, the smooth uh, flow of traffic. Um, the consequence of that for us not happening isn't as much as that we'll have too many blockages. There just might be no ships would come. So the consequences of a, of a hard Brexit for us could be the loss of up to 40% of our trade. Um, so instead of being congested, it'll be tumbleweeds um, that we'll be dealing with and, instead of having too much traffic. So for us, the engagement with DERA and the um, workings towards adhering to the command paper and protocol were very positive signs that actually um, we were going to mitigate as much as we possibly could uh, any impacts of, uh, in terms of uh, Brexit, uh, hopefully with agreement. Um, but the question comes whether or not we end up in a no-deal scenario, uh, whether the command paper and the protocol survives a no-deal Brexit or not, may be one down to political interpretation. And if that's the case, then uh, we would be very s sort of gravely concerned about the uh, potential consequences on the support that we would be able to give to the regional economy, that cross-border element of that economy uh, going forward. Because traders will take the line of least resistance. Uh, if there's going to be a lot of checks and bureaucracy around uh, in, in the ports, um, then they find other ways of, of, of working. And for us, we could be bypassed uh, with vessels coming into the Republic of Ireland and serving that region 
uh, instead of coming through through us. So um, I think it's a very it's still a very pressing issue, and I think the longer that it takes to resolve, the more concern that we would have. Okay, thank you. And Roger, you you'd mentioned obviously that you were still already essentially at this stage, and you've sort of held back. Yeah, um, I, I, I mean, uh, thank you, Chair and, and committee members. I mean, picking up on Morris's point, we're ready to go in terms of the plans, and I'm not an expert on the European legislation as to what's required uh, in terms of transiting into the new way of doing things post-transition. We're very much reliant on DERA. They have been, ext I've been really impressed by the speed with which they operate and the times that you get stuff, you know, at midnight and detailed plans and all that sort of stuff. So I've got uh, confidence that they know what they're doing. They know what capacity they need. And I think, you know, a couple of things I would say on that specific issue is that it's a function of what the inspection rates are going to be. So if you look at WTO traffic that comes through the UK all the time and indeed comes through Ireland at the moment, the inspection rates on that traffic is relatively low. And some of the inspection rates that I heard talked about, particularly down in the Republic when I was responsible for that operation down there, the inspection rates were way higher than the rest of the WTO traffic. And I questioned that. So that, I think that's a key issue, and I'm not sure what inspection rates that are being considered, but uh, it may be, uh, as Morris said, that they may be going for the, you know, they've probably got a, you know, worst case, probable case, best case scenario, and they're probably edging towards the worst case in that they've got to be ready. So, but in terms of infrastructure, I think once they get the green light to go ahead, we're ready to talk to them. We're ready to, 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 to come to the arrangements. Uh, the sooner the better, please. Uh, but I think my biggest concern is in terms of, if you like, agent capacity that is going to help traders and hauliers, and indeed not so much ferry companies, but certainly traders and hauliers, to get their systems into place so they can tell the ferry company and primarily HMRC, what they've got in their trailer and can they bring it across to Northern Ireland. And certainly my experience of uh, haulage businesses here is that you get the extremes of they're very much into systems and integration and they can deliver things very quickly to the people who are still relying on the fax machine. So, you know, and that is going to be difficult for some of them. And, of course, you're coming on the back of... Uh, or, approaching a period where cash flows for many businesses and indeed certainly our business has been hugely stressed and uh, if you then lump onto them by the way you've got to pay a lot of money for a system <clears throat> or even if it's training and bringing in extra staff i think that'll be problematical so one of the things that you may wish to think about is what training can be given to agencies and to people who have got the aptitude who can do what it what in effect is a quasi customs clearance system and uh, I have personal experience of this uh, one of the jobs I did I ran a port agency up in Teesside we had a service going to West Africa I did the import clearances you know from time to time we did really esoteric things like for example did you know that we import Guinness from Nigeria uh, uh, it's stronger than that made uh, down south uh, but the Customs duty and excise is quite complicated and it's a function of the alcoholic content and all that sort of stuff. It wasn't that difficult. And that was in 1992. And we had a, a computerised system. So it took me, and, you know, I'm not brains of Britain, it took a couple of weeks for me to be trained up to deal with that and no major issues. So the point I would make is that I think it's particularly given that we're going to be looking at a lot of people who are going to be searching for work, you know, when they, so there's people who will have the aptitude and the skills to be trained up in that quickly. So if you've got some money to put into training and you want to do that, then that might be a way, you know, and if you've got the capacity, then we can do it for everywhere else as well. David? The other way of phrasing that question is, um, will the joint committees, um, as, as, as a result of, you know, last minute successful negotiation with the EU, um, reduce the, the, the onus on checks and so on. The, the gap analysis that DARA have completed is that, you know, come what may, we are able to be compliant with the EU regulations. So that, that's my understanding of that. But, you know, as, as has been said elsewhere, 
if everything gets too complicated, and this is, we are talking about multi-agencies here, so you know, if there isn't a free trade deal with the EU, well then presumably the role that customs will have to perform will be considerably more complex. But um, if we make the whole process complicated, the, the, this notion of retaining unfettered access, which, which isn't there anymore, um, if we make it too complicated, economically the ports will suffer because, you know, as, as, as Brian says, ships will divert elsewhere. Which is why, you know, with Dara, all the ports have worked, you know, tirelessly to try and progress what is actually required. So I suppose really that the question was, you know, I mean, I suppose, how, to, how would you predict what you need? And at this stage, it's very difficult to know what you need. Well, HMRC can't be too specific because because they're not sure on what tariff arrangements are going to be in place, you know, and and they're. The, the software package for, for the new consignment notice for product to come from GB and NI, th that hasn't been written yet. You know, they're quite open about that, although they say they're confident it can be written. Um, customs can't be too specific about you know, what, what the nature of checks are going to be because they don't know what the, what the tariff arrangements are going to be. So there's, this, there's a massive amount of uncertainty still there. Um, and really, this was as a final question for myself, um, and to ask all of you, I'm mindful of the fact that we are the infrastructure committee, and I know that a lot of your discussions are with directly with with Dara. Um, what would your main ask be um, of us today? Well, I'll start by saying I have to say the engagement with the DFI has been very good throughout. They've always kept closely in touch, and they've worked with us, and they've also, I think seem to be very well informed and they've informed themselves particularly around the fact that the focus of attention really lies on the, you know, the shipping companies and the traders and that. We don't have any specific asks from DFI at the moment because from us, from our perspective, the, the, the locus of effort has quite clearly shifted to DERA and the HMRC and I think my colleagues have given you a lot of granular detail as to the all of the issues embedded in that. So I, I don't really, you know, beyond the fact they've been looking after us very well in terms of liaison and keeping in touch and, and having oversight as we do in the port, I don't have any specific asks of the infrastructure department. Okay. Yeah, I think I would echo that and say that the, um, in terms of the Brexit preparations, specifically uh, in terms of foil port, uh, we worked very closely with the DFI in terms of that uh, available funding that was there to make ready facilities and uh, and they did that and they they did it in extra quick time so um you know we have a very good rapport with them um it's unusual to come and, and not have a, a big wins list that we would normally have so i, I think under the circumstances they've, they've performed extremely well um as have dara i must say um and i, I think officials are, are doing what they can to comply with the command paper specifically. And I think as far as foil port are concerned, those arrangements, which are more modest than they would be in the other ports, uh, are defined and, uh, and agreed between us. And all we need now is to get that signed off. But time is of the essence. You know, so uh, that's the only thing I would say. It's pressing time-wise. Roger, David? Uh, yeah, I would echo what's been said already. Uh, and I think just two, two asks, really. One is uh, whatever... Uh, um, uh, pressure, if you like, you can bring to bear to get the decision made as to what is required. Please do that. And whatever pressure you can bear to bring on HMRC to get their systems clear. And I think my understanding is that they're talking about bringing a new system from uh, for Northern Ireland. I think it's called CDC. I may be wrong on that one. So uh, I think the current system is called Chiefs. I'm a bit out of touch with it at the moment because I've done it for a long time. But my preference in all these things would be to use a tried and tested method particularly given you know so we've already got enough uncertainty in terms of what's going to happen economically you know please try and take as much uncertainty out of what's going to happen and how it's going to be done as possible that it's as easy to do for the trader for the haulier and for the carrier the shipping lines okay thank you yeah we'd, we'd simply ask that the department continue to uh, listen as as attentively as they do currently and and predict and forecast like ourselves that you know it, it's likely that additional funding is is going to be required in in the near future as i'm hoping this isn't the case but it's hard to see how we're not going to have either a, a second um wave of, of the pandemic or a, a second economic wave and uh, you know we both we all need to try and be ready for both okay thank you
Uh, Mr. Buchanan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, gentlemen, for your presentation so far. There's obviously no your ports and no Northern Ireland imports, exports, and all that fairly well because you obviously work closely together. What's your understanding for plans and infrastructure likely to take place on, e.g., French soil or Belgium soil? Exports going into the mainland, Great Britain, across to them. Have you any communication with those ports or understanding what's happening in those ports? I can. I'm part of the uh, being part of PO, I'm part of the group that or the unit that operates Dover Calais. Uh, we are we are in extensive discussions with both the Port of Dover and the Port of Calais. At the moment, it operates under what's called the 2K agreement, whereby uh, the uh, British authorities are based in Calais and the French authorities are based in um, Dover to facilitate faster uh, faster operations. So to put it in perspective, uh, they handle about six times the number of trailers on a daily basis than we do. They are, they've basically got a ship on the berth loading at all times and they turn them around in 40 minutes and at the moment they're full. And uh, the issue with Dover for anybody who's been there is that as you go in, on the left-hand side, you've got the White Cliffs, and on the right-hand side, you've got the sea. There's not much in terms of space. In fact, it's called the M20, where they stack, operation stack, you've probably heard on the radio. So, but uh, my understanding is that we are working closely with them. Uh, the fact that we got this year of transition has helped us tremendously. And uh, I think that we will be ready to go. And I think just the final point on that, the, you know, a big chunk of the Republic's goods from the European Union comes through Dover and trunks up through to Holyhead and into, um, into Dublin. So interestingly, when the Dublin delegation went over to talk to, uh, it was, sorry, there was a meeting, that's right, there was a meeting in Dublin which one of our people attended and once they'd had the small talk, pretty much it was, well, how is it working in Dover? Because they were aware of the, you know, so you've got fast-moving pharmaceutical goods, that sort of stuff coming through, which they, of course, need to make sure is continuing to run. And if you think about Holyhead, I mean, that's, that has the opportunity to get really congested because you've got a relatively, you know, a narrow pinch point going through uh, as you come out of the port and you go over a bridge. So... You know, I, I, we'll put it this way, we, uh, Dover Calais for our company is our biggest cash generator. You know, if Dover Calais stops working, then we've got a problem with our business. And uh, whilst I'm not directly involved, we're as confident as we can be that as of the 1st of January, it's going to continue on. Do you see any additional infrastructure there? Any additional to what's there now? I'm not now sure that, I, I don't think there's a need for additional infrastructure because a lot of it's there already. And Calais certainly has a lot more space than Dover does. Uh, so, and uh, we, we don't think it's going to be a significant issue. Uh, and of course, uh, you have two shipping lines operating out of Dover into Calais, you've got P&O and DFDS, who are effectively in competition with the channel tunnel operation. So Dover Port and Calais Port are working extremely closely with the shipping lines to make sure that they don't lose business to the trains. I don't really have any uh, direct comments on that because the Port of Belfast op obviously doesn't run any rule-on, rule-off operations direct to the continent. All of our um, operations run straight to GB. On the container side, all our operations are scheduled services to Antwerp and Rotterdam. Uh, because they're in the container mode and there already is a, what's called a port community system, uh, in all the terminals, that means that uh, the processing of those cargoes is probably not going to be uh, greatly affected uh, in terms of throughput. Okay. Enough, I'll tell man. Yeah. Okay. Second question, if you don't mind, a quick question. More generally, I come back to Northern Ireland. Where do you see yourselves being in three years? <coughs> we're we'll talking about volumes. I appreciate you don't know exactly. So. Maybe that's a very open question, but we'll can, ask can I, I can maybe take that first, perhaps, if, if I may. In terms of foil port, um, the, 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 the sort of crisis that we're having in terms of Brexit and COVID uh, also comes in line with the environmental pressures that we have. So in a normal strategic cycle, you would be looking at more uh, environmental issues, perhaps. 
Um, so the big thing that we are going to have to deal with in the, in the sort of medium to longer term is how we decarbonise the activities of the port moving forward. And we have already made some moves in that because we think that the tonnage levels for the region are essentially fairly static. So unless we start displacing materials from each of the ports, um, Northern Ireland and the, the broader um, uh, sort of market that we have is the market, yeah. um, and it's, it's constrained by the, the sort of, you know, the, generally just the capacity. So the geography of where we are, we need to look to the future by recognising that uh, trade could w well be static and, in fact, could be lo lowered if we uh, move away from coal and oil products in the, in the sort of medium term. So the strategy we have is one of decarbonisation, moving towards... Um, uh, we've already got a, a, a planning application through now for a large data centre development, and we're looking to get into the more innovation space so that we'll, the future will look like a, a, a mixture of port activity with more modern look at renewable energy, offshore renew, renewables and the like. I think if we were to sit on our hands and only look at tonnages coming through the key as they are now, you would go into eventual decline. Well, I would echo what Brian says in terms of overall trading levels are tend to run on a sort of a plateau of tonnage throughput. And I mean, we agree with everything he says about uh, decarbonisation. If I was being optimistic, I would say that the economy requires a certain amount of trade in and out, and that will continue in some form. The effect of uh, Brexit on the 1st of January 2021 effect, I would like to think if there are interruptions or problems, then they will be ironed out over time as people get used to processes, adapt to those, and then restore the steady state. But I would say, a worst-case scenario, there could be a period of disruption. Yeah, ports are, are essentially barometers of the, of the economy. Um, if the economy is doing well, you know, the ports get busier. Um, we're not out of COVID yet. We wouldn't be anticipating growth, and uh, as Brian says, if, if if we achieve growth, it'll either be because it's been displaced from Dublin, or displaced potentially from one of the one of the other Northern Irish port, ports. Um, just to just to put it into perspective, I'm speaking specifically on ferry traffic from Scotland to Northern Ireland. Uh, roughly, it's about 400,000 freight units a year. That was more or less what was in the market last year. And that's been steadily growing as a result of increasing population. Um, the utilisation of the two main carriers was about 50%. So effectively, we were paying a lot of money to move empty space backwards and forwards. That's not sustainable. You know, it just can't continue on because you don't get the return on capital that you need to make a new ship. So that's the first point I would make. The second point I would make is that uh, I don't see uh, post-transition being a massive impact on trade volumes. I think that whatever such problems there are will be solved. And if you think about the short-term economic outlook, we're in this phony economic situation at the moment with people getting paid for doing nothing, and that clearly can't continue to carry on. And when people weaned off that stimulus, then you know we all seen the news last night you know, about the number of lost job losses particularly in the hospitality sector, et cetera, et cetera, which I think is going to hit people hard. We can see a pre-end-of-transition uh, boom coming up, as we did in March of last year. Uh, and then you can see the first quarter, particularly in terms of imported goods for supermarkets and other retailers, doing that, because people are not going to have money, there's going to be potentially uh, warehouses that are still full of stuff, and stuff's not going to be needed. <coughs> uh, so I can, you know, the, the, people have asked me many questions. Well, times, well, what do you think the number is going to be next year in terms of total number of freight units carried on that northern corridor? And I don't think it's going to be more than four hundred thousand. Back, you know, I'm not an economist, but you know, just looking at what's going on and the impact of what's happening you can see that people are going to have less disposable income, but therefore they're going to buy less stuff. Uh, and as, uh, as it's all be already been said, we're a bellwether for the economy, and you know, if people aren't buying stuff, then not as much stuff comes through ports, as simple as that. So, uh, and, but to answer the question specifically, if we are back to 400,000 in three years, I think that's 
that would be pretty good, is my honest opinion. And I think that, uh, but I think it's going to be difficult. And uh, I don't, as, as has already been said, we're not out of, we're not out of COVID. Great, thank you. Thank Mr. You. Hilditch. Thank Thanks. Chair, um, just on a sort of point of information, uh, Morris, you had mentioned that 50% of your trade was through the freight ferry, and you had some concerns over that. Are those the same concerns that Roger alluded to, and the fact that containers and whatnot, you don't know what's in them, is that? Yes, no, I think that I, we would have exactly the we same issue, well. because I think, you know, we have good data on how much cargo moves through the port and where it comes from and all of that. When it comes to what's called unitized traffic, which could either be a freight ferry or a container, we have much less information. Now, we do get manifests for all container traffic, but we don't get any information at the Port Authority level of the component parts of road trucks. Because effectively, the IRC is a motorway with two ports and a, a ship in the middle of it, so it's exactly as Roger says. You know, so, um, so we don't gather that data, and we never have. So we would then go to our freight ferry operator, Stena, to provide that information. Um, they themselves, I and mean, I'm not authorised to speak for Stena, obviously, but they themselves have some basic data, and they've been sharing that with DERA to help them with DERA's planning assumptions. So, I mean, Stena have been integrated into the process with DERA as well to make sure that the DERA officials are as well informed as they can be. But the, the overriding principle that there is not, uh, there is not good 100% validatable data on the contents of road ferry trucks is correct, in my view. Okay. Uh, I see on the foil presentation there there was reference to the Ports Grant Scheme. Yes. Uh, I think you've been lucky enough to get nearly 60% of that. Yes. It, was that a fund that was open to everybody, or was it only for certain areas? Or? Um, there was a, a million pounds available to all of the Northern Ireland ports, as I understand it, and we all put our best foot forward and uh, I suppose the allocation was dependent on what was readily doable at, at that point. So we did benefit greatly from it, but we had a, a site that was um, I just ideally suited for it at that point in time, and we were able then to fast track it and get it completed. But uh, there was a lot of really hard work went in by the department in that um, to facilitate that a, it. Was that a one-off grant? That we, yes. Yeah, was it? Yes. No, no, thank you. And the, the residue of that is still available for to be spent yet, is that correct? Well, we also made an application under the scheme to save money, which was extremely helpful in building our resilience of, uh, capability. Um, but as Brian said, I mean, I think that's the first public money that the port has received in the 20 years that I've been there, so that's uh, very welcome. Thank you very much. I don't, I, don't, other, I don't believe there's any residual funds left. What no, we were told was <laughs> anything that wasn't spent by the 29th of February literally that you hadn't you couldn't prove that you know you'd paid the invoice you weren't eligible to reclaim okay. no thank you just a question there uh i would join with you on commending your staff and coming through the period that we've just come through and hopefully we're we're starting to come out the other end of it uh in my mind there is much of a frontline staff as anybody in the country is uh how did it affect the business the ports COVID in general, really did it? Was there a drop off? Or, I know you said the stuff was still coming through and all, but was it, what sort of effect did it have? Our, our volumes initially dropped by about 30%. 30 so it, was, it was profound and, and severe. And um, the, the, the sales figures haven't recovered yet, but are certainly healthier than they were. From a ferry point of view, we uh, freight volumes reduced by about 50%. So we typically, p and would have typically operated 92 departures a week. We reduced that to 52. Uh, we just yesterday increased that up to 62. Uh, so the freight business is now tracking around about 20 to 30% less than it was last year. Uh, a huge impact for us was effectively the cessation of the passenger tourist business because non-essential travel is not allowed yet. So. Typically, we'd be doing about 3,000 tourist cars a week. That went down to a low of 50. We're doing about, last week we did uh, just over 800 tourist cars, so it's slowly coming back. But of course, we are restricted in the sense that our ships can take 410 people nominally, 
Uh, we, uh, whilst we had the two metre restriction, we were limited to 140 people on board the vessel, and now we've gone to one metre, we've increased that to 250. Uh, uh, so that, that's had a huge impact. We are anticipating that once people can go and travel as they wish, that we'll see as a, a big uptick in, um, uh, in demand. And I think that, you know, in terms of bright spots, I think the bright spot that Northern Ireland potentially has is it's a great opportunity for people to holiday in. And uh, personally, I'm not going to be putting myself into a metal tube at 30,000 feet uh, in the near future. So, you know, we're very much promoting the fact that ferry travel is, is a good thing to do. Uh, you can go outside on a ferry. And the air that comes into the ferry is, goes straight out, so we're not using recycled <coughs> air. So there's a bit of a plug for the ferry business. Um, could, could I maybe say that, that that COVID impact very much showed the difference between bulk, a bulk port like ourselves and the ferry ports? Because actually the activity levels through April and May were, April was one of our busiest months that we've, we've had in years. Mm. So the demands of the agri sector are still very much there. Um, there's some trade that we have lost because of COVID uh, but not to the significant uh, levels that David's referring to, um, and that those probably will be lost in this year, this trading year. But um, actually, the, the bulk sector has been pretty resilient. Um, the, the use of uh, aviation fuel and petrol obviously dropped down when the, the lockdown hit, uh, but the agricultural commodities have been really strong. And from the Port of Belfast point of view, I'd start with the operating model of the port and... Uh, Thankfully, we had very minimal impacts with our employees, so we, we didn't. We only had one or two people who were affected. So, uh, from an employee perspective, everything has been fine. In fact, staff availability has been very high. Uh, the operating model, in terms of the ability to throughput cargoes, has been basically unaffected. We already have a, a pandemic plan, which we invoked, and obviously a crisis management plan. And all of that was invoked. Trade, like my colleagues, uh, there's a significant dip for us in April and May. March was actually fine. I think we're running about 8% down year on year, something like that. Uh, too early to say what the trajectory of recovery will be, because that's the really big question to my mind as to what shape the recovery will take place. We, I wouldn't really venture an opinion on that at the moment, except with some minor indications of a, a bit of a, an upturn, but I wouldn't be getting too excited about it just now. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Boylan. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's a pity we didn't get an opportunity to visit the ports. We get a better understanding. I mean, I've been out at some of them before, and uh, some of the members' eyes lit up when you mentioned the Guinness. So, <laughs> um, I just want to ask the question about two specific points. One of them is about the digital paperwork. I mentioned, I think it's in your report from the HMRC. A um, couple of points around it. I mean, where are we at with it? Is it ready to go? Did you nope. get a date for it? Um, no. Nope. Is it is it a case of um, how the business feel about it? We're 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 not a hollier, um, um, so it's, I mean the, the board has an opinion on all these things, um, we're, but we're not a hollier, so we're not going to be subject to it. But but the idea is that a, a hollier will will roll into a trader in, in England, say, uh, the trader will provide them with different sets of paperwork. Um, and, and a new and a, the haulier will then reference that consignment through a government portal uh, to get a, a, cons, a consignment a single consignment number before same haulier then makes it to the port of choice he will confirm through the same portal what either the trailer number or the vehicle registration number is on the basis that they may have changed trailers if it's a consolidated load or whatever en route um, if then when he presents his paperwork at the port that doesn't tally with, you know, the government portal. He he will be he or she will be sent away. Just you know, they're not getting on the ferry. So, um, but no, that software is not written yet. So there's not in there any any other. Um, I think uh, just to amplify the remarks. So this is the engagement with the HMRC. You mentioned mm -hmm. there's the uh, other. Yeah. Uh, really, this is all about DERA and the HMRC to deliver this effectively by the first of January. And I don't think I think we're all 100% um, aligned with that. So on the HMRC, I knew that there interacting with us to develop the more details of the operating model and uh, my colleagues have already mentioned the computer system that's to be available and I think it's what's called the pre-lodgement model so the theory is and this is by the way is the GB to NI traffic mm -hmm. that all uh, the, the pre-lodgement model is key right because that is where the truck gets cleared 
effectively on the sea. So, in other words, the uh, the ferry operator will have an obligation to ensure that the truck has a movement reference number or equivalent before it goes on. Once then it goes on, that is then uh, sent to HMRC, who will then do a risk assessment on the sea, and then if there's something comes up, then they'll uh, react accordingly. So, but the, probably the more significant point to do with that, it, the, the, the role of the Port Authority in itself is quite limited. It, again, the, the, the locus of effort falls on the ferry company to check the trucks going on, the hauliers to have all the requisite documents before they arrive at the port, the trader, i.e. the owners of the cargo, to make sure that they provided the hauliers with the information. And then finally, back to the question of the intermediary ship agents and the like, if they're operating in that sort of ecosystem, they have to be obviously providing a support service for that. So um, my understanding is exactly like my colleagues, that's being developed right now, but it is key that that's delivered by the 1st of January. And we ask like to come. Yeah, I just got well, a couple of comments support everything that has been said already. I just refer you to my point G, second point of that. Please put as much pressure on HMRC to come up with their systems. I think there's two key risk areas that I've said at port. There's no, it's not allowed in. So then, therefore, it has to be sent away. But where's it going to go to, uh, and where's it going to park? And secondly, uh, it's uh, HMRC. I asked the question on a on a on a. Uh, open meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago, I said, how long will it take from the truck arriving and presenting their data at check-in to getting a response that that truck, that trailer is cleared to go to Northern Ireland? They didn't really answer that to my satisfaction. They said it would be, we're hoping it to be instantaneous. Well, you know, We've already talked about the 10 second thing, and if there was a significant, you know, if there's a delay of say more than a minute, you can very quickly get traffic backed up. So that's the first point I would mention. The second point is that they then, their targets to deliver, uh, following on from the risk assessment that Morris mentioned, that traffic can either exit straight out of the port or they have to do some intervention on it in terms of documentation or actual physical checks. They're giving a minimum turnaround time of that of uh, two hours. So, you know, it had better be two hours because our ships take two hours, 10 minutes to get between the two ports and uh, it takes very little time to, for the traffic to come out. So those are the two areas that I would have concern about and the fact that they just seem to be, be behind the eight ball in terms of getting this thing ready. And what I can tell you is that from a trader haulier point of view at the forum that I attended, there was significant concern that this would not be ready and significant uh, worries about how it was gonna work Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So I think that's that systems issue is I think from an infrastructure point of view we can make it work. So for example, you know if the infrastructure is not quite ready in the port, we've got 14 acres that we can utilise fairly quickly. You know the infrastructure I'm not so concerned about. It will be done, providing you guys give oh, they get the green light at Deera. It's the systems that I would have more concern about. But just a quick overview because said 11 to June new digital system to move, move back and forward as quickly as possible between here and Great Britain, and it's not ready, no dates for anything else, and it has to be ready for the first. And it, I asked it in the context of, you said use of the barometer, which is a right, the barometer of how the economy's grown or decreasing, whatever the case may be. The COVID experience, you're going to be one of the key generators of building the economy again, coming back in. You have you you've said about the essential workers and the key workers. You played a big role over the last couple of months, but certainly you're going to play that part in the economic regeneration as well. And in all of that, um, Morris, you said you've been talking to the FA. You have a good enough engagement. Yes, very good engagement. The, the, the hauliers certainly have a big part to play in all of this, and have played a big role. Um, has those discussions expanded out into the hauliers, the haulage sector, or is it just it's just a case of user responsibility taken in the containers, the row row service and everything else, or is there a broader discussion in terms of the, the economic recovery? Say, has there been a broader discussion? Um, no, I don't think we've uh, discussed that with the Road Haulage Association. There's been a huge amount of interaction with, between the Road Haulage Association and HMRC, obviously, because that's where um, the um, emphasis will lie. But in terms of what the post-COVID recovery trajectory looks like, no, I think it's a bit early days for that, uh, to be honest about that. And I think probably leading from your remarks, the key thing is that the operating models of the port remain stable because 
you know, largely these are infrastructure businesses. So if trade drops off by 10%, the basic operating model keeps going. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't really affect the operating model. I'd be very surprised if any of us have seen any significant impact on the operating model. So I think the preservation of the operating model and the efficiency of the free flowing traffic is, is key to that regeneration. Just, I think, just on, on the whole, is uh, our understanding from the contact we have, and obviously we talk to our customers daily, is that they want clarity from the HMRC as to how it's going to work. That's key. Fair enough. And just finally, Chair, the, the issue of this authorised economic operator status, um, could you give us an assessment of that and how that's going to, how would it affect in, in terms of protocol and everything else? Um, so. We have AEO status in the Port of Belfast. I don't think we're the only ones. Um, AEO status basically is a, a, to summarise, it's a compliance regime to make sure that the port has authorisations that are in place that allow goods to, tra to transit. So as far as we're concerned right now, we have everything in place on the AEO side. There will, of course, have to be just a um, checking process with HMRC that they're content with that. Uh, Basically, what happens is there's, you just don't have a port and you just don't turn up with ships and cargoes. Every port has to be authorised by HMRC as a point of entry. And the AEO status is very strongly linked to what's called your, I think it's a wharf approval, was the old fashioned term. So there are a number of approvals that a port authority needs to have to allow cargoes to come in. And AEO is basically, I would su suggest, a streamlining and efficiency measure that goes over that. We've applied for AEO, we've had it for some time. We did it in preparation for Brexit. and. That bit ran very well, I have to say. We had a very good response from HMRC. We also have AEO status, and uh, it was seen at the time. I mean, it, it's sometimes referred as a trusted trader scheme, uh, but it allows the. Uh, it's, it's about the confidence that HMRC has with the port and its systems uh, that it can be managed correctly. So they come in and they do a lot of auditing and various things. So, um, in terms of, in as much as that might be a Brexit mitigation measure, we introduced it. And uh, we have that now live at full port. And in terms of the haulage sector, they were calling for mutual recognition agreement. Has there been any discussion with relation to that? Well, again, at, at an arm's length sort of context, uh, I know that there is a big pressure being put on uh, the ship's agents, on the, um, the, the other people that work in the systems as well as the hauliers. Uh, and I think they are, they are very concerned about whether or not the systems are going to be up and running in time to avoid any. Uh, any delays. Uh, I think that's. I think there, those fears are fairly well founded. I would say, although from the port operator's point of view, that's a, a slightly removed situation. But if they get into a compounded problem with the paperwork and the delays, then obviously our operations can be impacted accordingly. Okay. Thank you. I'm just conscious of yeah. time. Just, um, Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair, and I'll try to be brief. Um, uh, Article 12 of the Northern Ireland Protocol gives the EU authorities right to, to access the ports to audit and oversee the implementation of the protocol. Just to see whether you have had any contact about that or any more details about how that's going to be implemented and what issues you would foresee around that. Uh, the only interactions we've had with our HMRC and DERA, I've never had any interaction with any European Union agency that I know of in the Port of Belfast. <coughs> it's exactly the same for us. That's the same for us. And on the same portal on, <clears throat> just to add, I mean, we get audited all the time by Department of Transport, for example, in terms of security, uh, etc. I don't see it as a major issue if they do decide they want to come up. Okay, so it's in the protocol, but there's been no contact or no preparation for that? No. Okay. Um, the other thing is around the goods vehicle movement services, uh, which we've talked about, which is the... Uh, where you have to uh, record your um, the imports uh, with the HMRC, and I understand that that is going to be they've committed to having that live on the first of uh, January, but they're going to trial it in November and give it 20 working days, and then on the basis that the work IT system is going to be ready. It's just whether your confidence around that and the ability, uh, in the context of previous uh, and the ability of the sector to be able to deal with this in the context of the losses that they've sustained through COVID. As, a, as an observer rather than a practitioner in this, uh, I don't think the track record of government in terms of that sort of technology implementation would give anybody in the industry a great deal of comfort, especially with those tight time frames. I mean, it's very close to the, to the deadline. Um, I, I don't think too many people in the industry think that that's going to happen. 
I think you're right. The GVMS, as you mentioned, is yes. kind of the linchpin to the HMRC process. But you know, it's it's very easy to be pejorative. You you don't know. All we can say is they're working with us, and we can just only assume that they will. They know the deadline, and they will deliver it in time. I would echo what everybody else has said, but it was it would be on the top of my risk list. Um, just also in terms of other ports on the on the island of Ireland, as you would you have concerns in terms of the way forward in terms of losing trade to other ports, or what's your relationship with them? Well, our principal relationship probably is as competitors. You know, I mean, yes. the Port of Dublin is a fairly big competitor to the Port of Belfast, uh, believe it or not, and. Uh, there's a lot of debate about displacement of traffic between the ports in Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, and there could be many reasons for that. You could have, uh, you know, cargoes moving that currently go through Dublin, maybe go through Belfast, but equally you could have some cargoes diverted back through Dublin. <coughs> they have a much bigger rural facility. They, I think, do about 1.1 million freight units in the south of Ireland. It's, a, and it's, it's actually quite interesting when you look at the island of Ireland. We do 850 in Northern Ireland, and they do about 1.1. So, you know, it's both jurisdictions you know, rely heavily on that. Um, the trouble about predicting that is you don't know what you don't know because the fact of the matter is there are so many moving parts in the economic jigsaw that I personally wouldn't venture an opinion and make sense of it, but you're absolutely right to signal it as an uncertainty and a risk. I see it as an opportunity as well. Yeah. Uh, and I think the thing to think about is that if you like the road from Larne through Belfast down past Warren Point down to Dublin is a continuum. And in terms of distance between ports, you know, it's not that big when you look at, say, European operations where you've got traffic that can go to Antwerp, Zeebrugge, Rotterdam, or even Hamburg, and still get to where it needs to go to from an, e from an efficiency point of view. And you know, uh, transportation these days is hugely more efficient. You've got a ship that can take 24,000 containers. So you know, this issue of getting goods from say New Zealand to the to, to the table here or versus getting it out of French French Loire Valley you know the cost is probably cheaper to bring it out of New Zealand so you know the co cost and somebody said you know traders will find a way cost in transport <coughs> supply chain and efficiency is hugely important and I would actually say that if uh, reliability of supply probably goes above cost Mr. Kim Ms. Kimmins. <laughs> Thanks, Chair, um, and thank you all for your presentation. And rather than going over um, <coughs> all of what has been said, I suppose more specific questions, Brian, for yourself. Or David, sorry, <laughs> I get mixed up now. In relation to Warren Point, because it's, it's close to my own constituency in Uri. Um, and it, it really concerns me the lack of clarity around this. You know, um, I am aware that the proposal by the British government in terms of the Brexit reg regulations for checking. Um, facilities. It's a 40,000 square foot uh, infrastructure. Um, well, th 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 those drawings haven't been finalised. In, in fact, th th the last information we had was that there was going to be a different new set of drawings uh, reconsidered. But, and that's even more concerning that we're six months away from the deadline and nobody even knows yeah, what's Yeah, six months minus one day now. It's less than six months. Less than six months, yeah. Um, so I suppose, and you've said there's a massive degree of uncertainty here. Um, I suppose a number of questions just around that. You know, have we any idea who is footing the bill for this? When construction is meant to start? If we don't even have the finalised plans, um, where is that at? Do we know? Well, ac according to the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, any additional facilities that are required at Northern Irish ports will be footed by Treasury by Westminster. That's that's our understanding. But it hasn't even been confirmed. Nope. No, uh, would it be fair to say then, David, that there's been no engagement even from the British government on, on this with yourselves or with any of the reports? There was a we we had a briefing from the Under Secretary of State um, at the end of at the end of May, beginning of June. Um, during that discussion, he he did confirm that were there any further facilities required that. Uh, Westminster will be paying for it, but that, that's been the extent of it. It was, it was a, a, a twenty-minute discussion about the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, and I suppose, and you've you've touched on it within your brief as well, in terms of the environmental impact 
and I know the area very well and, and it's a very picturesque setting and there's obviously concerns in the community as well around that because it's it's so close to the um, area of specific scientific interest <coughs> as well. So it's just to see if there's any idea around what the impact will be and you know what plans are there to have meaningful consultation, I suppose, with the community and uh, local elected reps once those plans have been finalised. It's, it's, it's a chicken and egg situation. I mean, un until until we know what is actually being proposed, and we don't at this stage, it, you know, how, how can we consult on anything? I suppose it's just as, to to make the point that I feel it's very, very important that once we get to that stage, that that, that is a key part of it going yeah. forward in terms of consultation. Yeah. Um, just the final one, and, and I suppose it's it's based on, and, and others have referred to um, the impact on hauliers, and I suppose it's it's something that impacts on all the ports. Um, you know, I've had a lot of engagement with local hauliers, particularly in the the Newry and surrounding areas there, and who are going through a very difficult time at the minute as a result of COVID. So Brexit on top of that, and the the lack of certainty around this. Um, if if this facility isn't completed on time. Um, what, where do you see? What are the implications that you see? I suppose it, as it stands. As it stands, assuming the joint committees don't move the goalposts and, and declare that there are less checks required, then th there is a potential scenario across Northern Ireland that the uh, that the food products that require SPS checks won't be able to come in. That's that's in a worst case scenario. And that's, I suppose, with with no um, concrete plans in place, it's it's certainly a possibility. You know that that worst case scenario can be mitigated by temporary arrangements, arguably, but we don't know whether the EU would accept those or not. Okay. No, that's fair enough. Thank you, uh, David. Thanks very much. Thank you. All. Okay. Uh, would you mind if I just make a couple oh, sorry. points? Sorry. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no problem. Firstly. In terms of the consultation, my understanding is that any uh, new infrastructure or facilities will be subject to planning permission. So I would have thought then there's the consult consultation process. The other point I would make is that uh, the uh, transport supply chain that we're all part of is extremely resilient. It's very quick at thinking on its feet and coming up with solutions. And if the facilities aren't ready, then we as an industry will work with the whatever authority is at the moment it's DIR and HMRC and I've got no doubt that we'll come up with a pragmatic solution. That's the way we've always done it. And I appreciate uh, irrespective of what the crisis has been. I know what you're saying around planning permission, I think, but with with the port that it's within permitted development, would that be right, David? So it might not be the same That's right. process. Uh, port well certain areas within ports do have permitted development rights so it's it's not subject to the the, the same public yeah. scrutiny process that, well, that normal that's planning permission would require yeah yeah but if, if we're able to to put that in place i think it would definitely help a lot years i suppose within the community and, and make sure everybody's involved it's it's a it's, it's a double-edged uh, blade in that regard because if the planning process takes too long then you're you're straight back into putting those hauliers you talk about out of work and uh, and, and jeopardising the supply chain. So, yeah, we once <laughs> it, it's it's why we've all asked you know if if, we, if this process can keep going as as ex expeditiously as possible, you know we we have a chance of being able to you know keep everybody on board. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And uh, thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Brian Morris and. Roger and David, I find that the information you sent in to us as members of the committee very informative. Uh, also, your your presentations this morning, and as 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 I have been dealing with a number, particularly across my own constituency, like the Chamber of Commerce and others, it's just I'm hearing the same echoes coming through of um, industry and businesses feeling uninformed, unprepared, and a lack of understanding. And um, I think, Morris, you made the point. With regards to the command paper, uh, being a, it is a British government paper, so it is not an EU British government paper, and that's probably uh, creating its own difficulties and lack of certainty for yourself. The one thing we do know is that the withdrawal <coughs> agreement and the Irish protocol is an international agreement and has been agreed by the EU and the, the British government. So if we are facing into the worst case scenario, What's unfortunately, as we sit here today on the 1st of July, it seems to be the case, because despite 
what Warren Point was told around the modification uh, that was potentially going to take place around an extension. That hasn't been asked for, and in fact, the British government said there would be no extension uh, to, to the transition period. So going back to the question that was asked about the grant, and uh, you all probably um, need it, uh, such a grant to prepare. Brian, in your paper, you had mentioned that you used this by way of looking at a no-deal scenario. Mm. So the kind of resilience, given that you know what will happen in a no-deal, even though you haven't got any information from HMRC about the protocol, I say what will happen, like Brian is saying, 40% of your trade is going to be affected if there's a hard Brexit. You all know how damaging it's going to be to uh, each of the ports if it's going to be a hard Brexit. Brian, what have you been able to do with that half a million by way of preparing in for a no deal? And have you, are you all generally prepared in the event of, in less than six months' time, we go over a cliff and that's the reality of what we might be facing into? I mean, uh, Martina, just to answer that initially, the. Um the initial engagement with the department was around no deal preparations, actually. So that's what it was designed to do. Yeah. So, um, and that takes account of any transport glitches or any of the bureaucracy hitches and things that we've talked about. But I, I think a more um, fundamental issue for us in terms of if there's no deal, what do we do? Um, we press on with our diversification model and program because no deal could ultimately mean significant loss of trade and tonnage across the quay in the traditional port model. So unless we are going to, uh, you know, we, we, must, we must be progressive and look at how we, we look at that. And we know that we're going to be faced with the whole decarbonation thing anyway, decarbonisation. So um, I think no deal is just maybe one of the more pressing issues around the trade, but there are more fundamental long-term issues for the port industry to be looking at in terms of engagement with renewables and, and all of those things. So um, I think that our uh, actions and efforts alongside of the grant scheme, for instance, were only one part of the plans that we have to move the port into a different place to ensure our sustainability, which is our core duty that we have uh, to our stakeholders. <coughs> Uh, just on behalf of the Port of Lana, if the, my understanding of a no deal is so that uh, it will remain transit of goods as it is today, so then traffic will flow freely in and out of Port of Lana. And if that is the, to my mind, unlikely scenario, but we all plan for it, then you can see that more traffic will come through Northern Ireland than would ordinary transit out of, say, Wales into the Republic of Ireland direct. So, but you would expect that to be a relatively short term, by short term I mean three to six months whilst things start to equalise. But yeah, if, if, if things remain as they are, then traffic that we carry will continue to flow. I suppose that's not going to be the, I'm, I'm just looking at the other ports, that's not going to be um, the we, situation you, the, the other ports find yourselves in? We, we use the funding to strategically reconfigure the operational footprint. So on the one hand, if Brexit is hard and, and, and problematic, we can have a you know a giant car park. Um, and if it isn't, and it actually presents opportunities, that we can avail of those because we've created usable space. And who know, <laughs> I don't know how it's going to play out on the first of January. I just, well, I, just I think it's, I think it would be informative for us as MLAs to know that in the event of going over a cliff, there are certain ports that we would need to be actually engaging with mm. more than others. Because, for instance, if it's not going to have any impact, in fact, Lauren is telling us they actually <coughs> might benefit from it because there might be more traffic coming in. Then it will direct 40, us. To 40, Forty percent of our volume uh, heads into in the Republic of Ireland. If there's all sorts of new boundaries and barriers, then yes, we're going to be profoundly impacted. Well, I mean, what you're looking at is the, it's the other way, actually. It's going to be the problem. It's going to be what's coming in from Britain, because that's not in the protocol. What's in the protocol across the island will be OK. It's going to be what comes across from Britain over there, you see. And that's what I would like to ask you about, because we've heard some information about the ports and you had said about the engagements you've had with Dara, Dara sorry. Um, in relation to the infrastructure for Brexit control uh, border posts, 
And I think it was Roger, you said, for instance, you, you have the space. So if you have to erect such infrastructure, that that would be easy enough to do if you had the understanding about what was required. Are all the ports um, sort of Sorry. ready for the event? Of Sorry, can I just clarify one point? What I said was, in the event that the current facilities that are planned are not ready, we have space that could be relatively easily used. Now, you know, what I'm thinking about is we've got 14 acres that's effectively brown field. We would scrape it and we would turn it into trailer parking very quickly. Putting infrastructure on that space, that's a different issue. But, and that would require a pragmatic approach to achieve that in the event that the Northern Ireland Protocol is enacted and uh, we don't have some sort of, uh, whatever it's called, no-deal no scenario and things carrying yeah. as they are. And we, all, we understand the difference between the border control post and the custom posts. Uh, so therefore, what I'm trying to ascertain, if all the ports would be ready in the event of additional measures have to be put in place for Brexit border control posts, uh, the custom checks, I mean, that, that may be another situation, if, they are, if there is, if there isn't, for instance, a, a crash out Brexit, then hopefully custom checks might be resolved uh, or dealt with in that future relationship. But if it's not, it's to ascertain are all of the ports, for instance, having the same capacity as yourself to deal with border control posts to turn something into, if it's not infrastructure, but if it's a facility that's required for, for trucks. Um, are the ports ready? Uh, in the event of, in six months' time, that being a necessary outcome of either a crash out Brexit or a future relationship. So just to add from the point of Belfast, uh, it's identical to the approach we're on point. We've utilised that money to create additional acreage because, I mean, the, the simple thing is that port is a very land-hungry business. It consumes a lot of land. So the solution in many cases is basically acreage that you can then employ. So we do have assets reserved that in the event of something untoward happening. I suppose probably the overriding uh, consideration though is ferry movements are on a booking and allocation system. So it isn't a case that a truck just turns up in Belfast or in Liverpool. They're booked and allocated. I would suggest that if there is a problem, the ferry won't move the truck in the first instance because it won't be cleared to load either at the other side. So. You know, that would tend to indicate that you won't really have a congestion issue in the port because I think the ship won't sail effectively with the ferry and that's uh, with the truck, sorry. So I think that kind of uh, overrides the whole debate. And the other thing, of course, is that, you know, we're positing into an extreme uncertainty as a result of the uh, any dissonance between the Northern Ireland Protocol and the command paper. So that remains, I think, right from the outset as a, a significant uncertainty. And that is why all my colleagues have sort of pointed out the need to accelerate the processes with DERA and the HMRC to get that certainty and hopefully that will be delivered on time. And there's lots of businesses asking the same question as yourselves. Uh, you're quite the right. The port industry is only one portion of that ecosystem in fact and you've got the, the haulage companies, the ferry companies, the traders, the owners of cargo, intermediaries, the whole bit. Yeah. Look, there's lots of other questions, Chair, but I'm, I'm conscious of time. Okay, thank you. Mr Beggs, please. Yeah. Again, thanks for your presentation. It's good to hear the, the difficulties you're facing, because ultimately everything has to be solved. There has to be a solution. Um, in terms of the port infrastructures, uh, is everybody no planning permissions for these buildings yet? So you still need planning permissions, tendering, and then uh, actual build. In six months is getting tight, I would have thought. Would, would that be reasonable to say that? I, th I think... Uh, port operators have what are called permitted development rights. Obviously, the PD rights mentioned previously are quite key. Um, the whole area of planning is its own science, as you know, but uh, on the face of it, if anything ever seemed to suit PD rights, it would be this sort of stuff, because it's it's very traditional port infrastructure. Does everybody have those rights? Yeah. Yes, okay. it's a, we're all statutory undertakers for the purposes of PD. Okay. Then in terms of um, Brexit and other side COVID, the implications for... Um, passenger or people tourist movement and I mentioned Roger had, had mentioned opportunities that could come from this because people are nervous about getting on a plane um, so can you advise uh, are you everybody currently taking passengers again and tourist traffic or is that still on hold where are we with that oh, well I, I can't speak 
you know, with any authority for a ferry operator, but they're still operating passenger services. It's just that they've been massively impacted. I mean, cargo's down a bit, but passenger traffic has been completely floored, basically. We've also, in the Port of Belfast, effectively lost our cruise traffic for the year 2020, which is obviously not good for the tourism economy, and that's just one of the, that's, an, that's a direct COVID effect. But would you accept that with um, the, air, the airlines starting to ramp up their business and try and encourage international tra uh, travel, that there's equally nervousness about getting on a plane and there could be additional ferry traffic from tourism hmm. uh, across the RIC and opportunities there both ways? So are you looking at uh, trying to uh, delve into that? And what's uh, social distancing are you putting in place to give people reassurance and encouragement to, to, to travel and that means? Perhaps I can pick up on that, uh, if, given that I'm both for P&O, if you're okay with that. Yes, no, 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 absolutely. In terms of the ferry operations, passenger business has continued right the way through. Uh, so every operator reduced their capacity on board the ships by about, down to about a third of what they'd normally be. So we went down to 140, I think Stena went down to about four, something like that. That will be gradually lifted. But even when you look at the number of people who are travelling, and I think off the top of my head, I think it's about 1.7 million or something like that, travelling back and forth, and you multiply the number of the capa passenger capacity, there's plenty of capacity. Now, the passengers may not exactly want to go at the time that that capacity is available, but it will be there. Whether the airline capacity is going to be there going forward, I really don't know. Uh, but uh, we will have the capacity to satisfy the demand and by we I'm talking about the ferry yeah. wider ferry industry and, and in terms of people movement and around the, the, the Brexit issue uh, again uncertainty but um, there isn't going to be a, a land border where people are showing passports have you been advised of the need for any uh, uh, ID checks in terms of movement on ferries um, my understanding is and this was raised fairly closely after the vote took place is that the common travel area will remain and that there will continue to be free movement of people between the United Kingdom and those other members of the free travel FTA. So for example uh, I was in Gatwick a couple of years ago and I forgot my passport and I was, I'd forgotten that I was flying into Dublin and not coming back to Belfast and the security guard said to me and I just showed him my driving license. Security, I, so I had to tell the security guard that because I was going to Dublin, my driving license was okay. So, you know, uh, it's whatever documentation we require is going to be minimal, and we're not anticipating any disruption, what's, disruption whatsoever to passenger travel as a result of uh, post-transition. It's, it's a fairly moot point for Warren Point because it's an unaccompanied uh, ferry service, so <laughs> there are very, very few passengers on it. Okay, thank you. Um, um, that's our, our questions at this stage. I um, appreciate this wasn't perhaps the ideal format today, um, and but I do hope that you all thought that you had an opportunity to say um, and had adequate time to, to answer. And I do hope that in the not too distant future, once restrictions are lifted, certainly from our perspective with regards to visits, that we will be able to visit all of the locations and, and have a much more detailed um, on-site on discussion. So um, this is really the start of, of, our, um, of our engagement. And, um, and again, apologies with regards to that. And really just on leaving, if you would then pass on our gratitude, collective gratitude, to all those around all of your ports um, for the work that you have done over the last number of months keeping food on our shelves and so on. It's been very, very much appreciated. And certainly at the early part of the lockdown, we were concerned about how that would how that would play out, and of course it has been seamless. So thank you very much for that. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, members, for, for keeping within the time. Obviously, we were okay. we were respected today, and, and it, it wasn't an e it wasn't easy for, for them either. Yeah. Um, just to have the conversation, but I think that we were able to touch on, on, on most of the points, so I appreciate that. Um, are members content that we move on, or is there...
there isn't anything. Well, maybe the, really the follow up what you said about at some stage also getting a site. They were obviously very, they were positive about their agenda. engagement, obviously, with the DFI and so on as well. And the issues in relation to HMRC are out, out with our um, confidence. Okay, moving then on to um, item six, which is the Le legislative consent motion, business and planning bill, and that's at, at page 41 um, are the, the documents relating to that. At, on your table papers uh, at page three, you'll have the draft report for that bill. Um, members note that the draft report has to be agreed at this meeting. Any um, typos or, or formatting errors in the report will be amended at proofing stage before it's circulated to MLAs and then unpublished on the committee website. Um, I'm assuming that members have read it and if they have any amendments to the draft report at this stage, if you could let me know. What we will do is we will go through um, sort of the main headlines and ensure that you're content. So we refer you to the contents page and committee membership and powers page of the report, which is page three. Are members content? The title page contents page and committee membership and powers page stand part of the report. Okay, thank you. Introduction and background. That's um, introduction background sections of the report are paragraphs 1 to 11 of the report. Are members content that the introduction and background sections of the report are paragraphs 1 to 11 of the report? Are you content? Yeah, great. You. Then, if we move then to the purpose of the bill, paragraphs 12 to 14. Are members content the paragraphs 12 to 14, which outline the purpose of the business and planning bill, stand part of the report? Okay. Okay, thank you. Then, moving to paragraphs 15 to 18, which is the purpose of the LCM. Are members content that paragraphs 15 to 18, which outline the purpose of the legislative consent motion, stand part of the report? Done. Okay. And then refer you to paragraphs 19 to 20, detail or consideration of the LCM. Done. Are members content that paragraphs 19 to 20, which detailed the committee's consideration of the legislative consent motion, stand part of the report? Yes. Annexes. List um, inclusion in annexes A to F of the report. Are members content that the annexes stand part of the report? Great. And members content for me to clear an extract of the draft minutes of the me of this meeting for inclusion in Annex F to enable the report to be finalised. The draft minutes will be replaced by the final version of the minutes once agreed by the committee. Content? Yeah. And I have to seek your agreement for the report to be published on the committee's website and issued to all MLAs or members content. Content. Okay. And further advise that the committee staff will notify members when a date for the debate on the LCM has been scheduled. Monday. And it is on Monday. Monday? Yes. Monday, yeah. Next yeah. Monday. Next Monday. Okay. Content. Thank you very much. Moving then to um, subordinate legislation, which is not subject to assembly proceedings. Uh, page 132, we have the Road Races Garen Point Hill Climb Order, Northern Ireland 2020. This rule is not subject to any assembly procedure and is not required to be led. The rule will permit the suspension of the right of way of traffic on Saturday the 8th of August 2020 from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. to allow the Mid Antrim Motor Club Limited as promoter of the Garen Point Hill Climb 2020 to hold the event. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Great. Okay. At page 134, the Road Races Cookstown 100 order. This rule is not subject to any assembly procedure and is not required to be led. The rule will permit the suspension of the right of way of traffic on Friday the 11th of September 2020 from 7am to 8pm and on Saturday the 12th of September from 7am to 7.30pm to allow the Cookstown and District Motorcycle Club Road Racing Limited as promoter of the Cookstown 100 2020 to hold the event. 
Are members content with the proposals of the statutory rule? Great. Yes. Great. Thank you. At page 136, uh, we have the drought spelga pounding reservoir order Northern Ireland 2020. This rule is not subject to any assembly procedure and is not required to be laid. The Department for Infrastructure proposes to make a statutory rule under powers conferred by Article 137 of the Water and Sewage Services Northern Ireland Order 2006 to grant a drought order to Northern Ireland Water Limited. The drought order is required to address the threat of a serious deficiency of supplies of water in Spelga impounding reservoir caused by an exceptional shortage of rain. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Thank you. At page 138, the Drought Black Springs Emergency Abstraction Order, Northern Ireland 2020. Again, the rule is not subject to any assembly procedure and is not required to be led. The Depart Department for Infrastructure proposes to make a statutory rule under powers conferred by Article 137 of the Water and Sewage Services, Northern Ireland Order 2006, to grant a drought order to Northern Ireland Water Limited. The drought order is required to address the serious deficiency of water of supplies of water which exist or threatened in the area served by Loch Fay Reservoir by reason of an exceptional shortage of rain. Are members content with the proposals for the statutory rule? Great. Um, At page 140, the, um, the drought Altna Hinch impounding reservoir order Northern Ireland 2020. This rule is not subject to any assembly procedure and is not required to be led. The Department for Infrastructure proposes to make a statutory rule under powers conferred by Article 137 of the Water and Sewage Services Northern Ireland Order 2006 to grant a drought order to Northern Ireland Water Limited. The drought order is required to address the threat of a serious deficiency of supplies of water in Altna Hinch impounding reservoir caused by an exceptional shortage of rain. Are members content with the proposals of the statutory rule? Yes, right. Thank you. Moving then to um, support and legislation SRs, not subject to assembly um, proceedings. At uh, page 143, it's SR 2020 114, the Taxis um, Port Stewart Order, Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal of the, for the rule was considered by the committee on the 29th of April 2020 and was content. The rule is not subject to <coughs> assembly resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Great. Thank you. That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020 114, the Taxis Port Stewart Order, Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Page 147, we have SR 2020 115, the Taxis Carrick Fergus Order, Northern Ireland 2020. The proposal for the rule was considered by the Committee on the 29th of April and was content. The rule is not subject to Assembly resolution. There has been no change to the policy content of the SR since the SL1 was considered by the committee. Are members content with this rule? Great. Thank you. That the Committee for Infrastructure has considered SR 2020-115, the Taxis Carrick Fergus Order in Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Thank you very much. Rule on the 15th. Sorry? Rule on the 15th <laughs> of July. <laughs> Moving then to um, correspondence. Just um, draw your attention to the correspondence memo at page um, 151 and table papers at page 8. Um, there are a number of items there um, to be discussed and, and to be noted. Uh, we've, at page 161, we've correspondence for the minister, from the Minister regarding the vehicle lift faults at the MOT test centres and DVA action plan. Um, are members content with this at this stage, or is there anything further that you'd like to to add? Do we know? I'm here. Do we know the readiness? I mean, how many more have still to be lifts have still to be installed? We know that there's a program going on, and seven have them installed. But what is the plan to have them all ready and subsequently open? 
Well, the most the most recent response I received from her this, from the minister this week was that the ten had were what's, ready. What's the date when they're ten were ready? But there were obviously um, the two of the centres are being used. Belfast and Newton Arts are being used um, for COVID testing, and so they may not be ready until late in the autumn. Um, so that might be something further that we may want to ask her. Um, certainly, I had made course I asked the Minister of Health the question in relation to when he would no longer need the Nard Centre, and we're talking towards the end of September until an alternative arrangement is made. So there are um, there's still some outstanding issues in relation to that. We could go back and just ask for Claire for a more up to date. Um, Okay. Moving then, anybody else? Mr. Boylan? Sure, yeah, can we talk about the act? There's an action plan 163. Can, or do you um, want to, go ahead. It's just, it says there's an action plan about confirmation and arrangements are in place to properly record all key decisions and key meetings. And I'm just wondering, can we ask why that wasn't in place previously? You know, to basically that's what I was saying, you know, to properly record all key decisions and key meetings. and. We just, I'd like to find out why that wasn't there previously. And also, the issue still goes back to the the issue of the load cycles. You know, the you know the initial estimate of product life expectancy. So, okay. So, so you can find out more on that. That's and that's in the the actual uh, um, action plan. And if you need me to come back to you, send on the okay. correct detail, Laurie. Right? Okay. Um, one seven four's response from Nilga with regards to the Mineral Products Association briefing, and they are to come back to us with actually more detailed information just with regards to that because I think really they they sort of start to stray into general enforcement as opposed to specific enforcement with regards to <coughs> the issue that we had raised. Um, at one seven six, we have a response from the Department of Finance to uh, again with regards to MPA. Um, any members, any comments on that? Or again, then on the streamlining of annual reports, which came through that came through from the Department for Infrastructure with regards to their um, changes. Um, and page 183, we have um, a response from the Minister for Infrastructure um, with regard to a number of issues which were raised on our, at our meeting on the 10th of June. <coughs> we'll obviously be able to follow up with her on a number of those issues when she comes to the committee next week. But if there's anything specific at this stage, it wasn't. It was more related to the one before that, page one eighty two. <coughs> oh. oh. From the driving instructor. Yep. It was just. It was just a quick one. Um, it was my understanding, just from speaking to colleagues, that um, the infrastructure minister and economy minister were to bring a proposal forward, hopefully this week, in relation to um, when driving instructors can start work again. So it was just to see if we could check if there's any update on that or if that's progressing. Um, I know last week following the executive's announcements there's been a lot of confusion for driving instructors. Um, right up until last night I was getting uh, I've had contacts because there had been people putting out that they could start on Monday the 6th and obviously that's not the case. Um, and I know obviously our motion's going forward on Monday anyway in terms of guidance so it's just to see if there's any um, update on that. I don't know whether we, within the time um, you know, time limited. We could get a response from from either of the ministers about where they're at with that. And you know, in terms obviously, of adding to the confusion was the fact that they were told that they didn't need to stop work at all. Um, so uh, if you can recall last week in our papers, when we got a response, it was actually stated that there was no instruction given to the driving instructors to stop work. That nothing, there was no compelability for them to do so, and I think that created a lot. Confusion because we brought that up and said, "Why are we saying that?" And then we're telling them that they are going to have to wait until notification is given to them about the distance. And so I think it was in the papers, and and the driving instructors found that strange because that wasn't what they understood. But the difficulty, obviously, for driving instructors is that there really is an awful lot of point in starting class or starting lessons yeah. if you don't have testing in place. Um, I suppose the. The difficulty for them to, to understand was the fact that if they were able to continue working, then why could those who were testing not continue working too? So there was uh, there's a I, lot of confusion. I, I some of them had found it strange that they could have someone in the car with them, even to teach them how to drive. Right, we'll, get, we'll see if we can get any further information. We're unlikely to get that probably in advance of Monday, but um, we can always try. Just to kind of raise it. No, thank you. 
Okay, um, so members are, uh, agree sure. then. Yes, sorry. You're still going back to 183? 183, on 183 yes. Yeah, see the part about the Dalrady and stuff? Yes. Um, and said there's no conflict of interest. Could we ask if there's any other tenders? Uh, and there was any other conflict of interest in relation to tender? Was any other, ask if there's any other tenders? Which didn't have any links with the Specifically to Dalrady? Yeah, Dalrady, yeah. yeah just didn't have any links with that reading, okay? Okay. Are members content then to uh, address some? We, we'll get a, hopefully we'll get a better, a quicker answer if we leave it to the Minister coming up yeah. then. Yeah, yeah, but on that yeah, yeah okay, point. yeah, but saying the Minister. On that specific okay. point. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, other, content with the, um, how it's, other items of business or other items of correspondence to be dealt with as detailed yeah, great, the yeah. table, thank you. Moving then to our forward work programme. Um, we have that up until the end of, um, till next week, the 8th of July. Okay, members content with that? Yep. Okay, and we'll have something else in place then, next tentatively week. then for, um, for one. Any other business, any items members wish to raise at this stage? Chair, just one. Um, Follow. It's just again. I'm starting to sound like a broken record in this, in terms of extension to planning permissions. But I suppose from the briefing we had from the Mineral Products Association, they have still said that it, they feel it would also be um, beneficial, despite the minister saying that she thought it was no longer required. So, England have recently announced, and you know some of its detail within the LCM paperwork there as well. Um, they have recently announced their plans to extend planning permission to help. As people are coming out of COVID, so it's just can we again speak, ask the minister to, to consider this? I think it's I think it's still very important. Again, do you want to? We may get a better answer if we get it next week, or do you want? You can. Yeah, well, it, yeah, well, she's, it, yeah, it right now she's here next week, week. But I just want to put it in record because I think you know to say that it's no longer needed isn't actually true because construction and everything aren't fully operational. So well, the fact that this was was actually raised was very very early on. Yeah. Um, at, I probably her, fir her first COVID um, yep. statement, uh, and we're still really no further. Yeah, I, I, I think it's still a key issue. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any other issues at this stage? Okay, just remind uh, members to maintain your social distancing as we leave the, the room and to remove all your papers, your water jugs, and glasses from the meeting room as well. The date and time of the next meeting is in this room at, at 10 a.m. on the 8th of July. The meeting signed. Thank you. Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. <laughs>